Well, let's give it up for the song leaders one more time. Let's get right into it. Let's go to Acts chapter 1. Acts 1, verse 1. Hope we're excited to get into the Word of God here this morning and get into a Bible study. Because we're a Bible church, amen? Acts 1, verse 1, Bible says, in my former book. So the writer here is Luke. The former book is Luke. And Acts is Luke 2, basically. You got that? Theophilus. Theo means God. Phyllis is friend. Theophilus, friend of God. So that's you this morning. I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions to the Holy Spirit, to the apostles he had chosen. After suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know, it's a powerful scripture here where the scene's amazing. We understand that Jesus Christ was killed. He was buried. And then he raised on the third day. And what's amazing here is that Jesus is literally in his resurrected body having a meal with his guys. Can you imagine having a meal with the resurrected Jesus? It's almost funny if you think about it. And he gives them a promise and a command. The command was don't leave Jerusalem because the spirit of God, which is the promise, will come powerfully upon you. And Luke 4 says the Spirit of God is given to us as disciples so that we could become preachers of the gospel. And he tells them that you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Or in other words, be my witnesses to all nations. You see, Jesus wanted a church of all nations. He just didn't want a black church. He just didn't want a white church. He just didn't want an Asian church. He just didn't want a Latino church. He wanted a church of all nations. And look around. Look at all the nations that come to worship God here this morning. But he says to the nations, you will be my witnesses. The title of my lesson here this morning is witnesses to all nations. And we got a little PowerPoint for you guys once again. You know, I thought we had an amazing service so far. Let's get up for Brianna for incredible communion. And Isai, you did a good job introducing her, amen. And Jim, I love Jim's preaching. He did a great job this men's movie. He did a great job today preaching contribution. I hope that we gave our contribution and our special missions. You know, witnesses to all nations. That's what God wants us to be. And we've already mentioned it before, but we're not just, we not just come to some church around the corner on 39, 39 Marine Avenue. This is a little piece of God's big dream to get to all nations. And we're a part of a worldwide movement that believes in this mission as Acts 1 verse 8 is our theme scripture for what we like to call the Crown of Thorns Project. And already mentioned this year in 2024, we're planting 24 churches for the Lord. And what's amazing is that these people are not going, when we say plant their church, we're not talking about just like building some church and going back home. Like a little building. As Jim said, the church 
is the people. So people are uprooting their lives. And coming this year, after the planning of the Carolinas, we're going to have a sold-out church in every single state of America because we believe we should be witnesses to all nations. What does that mean? Witnesses to all nations. Doesn't it sound so cool? Who here wants to be a witness? Well, we understand a couple things. You know, I, I used to grow up uh, going to like black Baptist churches. And the preacher would go up and this, he's that fire, always fired up. He's like, hey, can I get a witness here this morning? And be like, amen, brother, amen, I'm your witness. But basically what he's saying is, if you feel what I'm saying, can I get an amen over there? You know, the dictionary definition of a witness is a person who sees an event, typically a crime or an accident, and takes witness to it. But we are a Bible church, like I said, let's get the Bible definition of witness. The Greek word for witness is martus, which is where we get our word for martyr. So what Jesus is telling these men and what you just signed up to be, if you want to be a witness for Jesus Christ, is that you have to be willing to be a martyr, to die for your faith. As Luke 14 teaches us, if anyone wants to be a Christian, they must take up their cross, period. Meaning that if you want to be a Christian, if you want to be saved, you have to be willing to die for Jesus. Not a common thing you hear right now in our modern day Christian society. People want to say they're Christian, but not want to read their Bible. People want to say they're Christian, but not want to pray. People want to say they're Christian, but make church optional. People want to be a Christian, but for sure don't want to die for it. But I say not here in this room. We're going to be the witnesses. We're going to be the martyrs. We're going to sign up to die for Jesus Christ so his dream can be taken to every single nation under heaven. Are you guys with me here? But to do that, it's going to take conviction. It said many convincing proofs. You see, we're not just Christians because we feel good about it. I'm a Christian because I believe what the Bible says is true. Our first point, witnesses for the truth. You know, over here we see Luke saying that there is many convincing proof that he's still alive. And you can jot this down. We're going to do a bit of a Bible study on truth here. Where in Luke 1, verse 1 to 4, let me read to you the NLT version. He says, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They use the eyewitnesses' reports circling among them from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. So this passage, what Luke is saying He's saying that he had eyewitness, the way the book of Luke was written was that he had eyewitness testimonies gather around him and he interviewed them to produce the book of Luke. But then we know in Acts, he does the same thing for Acts 1 and 16, but then eventually at some point he himself is an eyewitness as he travels in Acts 16 with Paul and as a missionary. And what he's saying is, you must be a witness to everything that was taught to you because it is true. And today, I believe every single one of us is going to have to make a decision. Is what the Bible saying true? Because if it's true, if what the Bible says is absolute, actually the truth of the universe, it should change our lives. It should absolutely change what you would do after the service. It's going to change what you're going to do on Monday and Tuesday. It's going to change how you, how you live every single hour of your life if you really believe it's true. Let's study it out. Let's go to Acts 2. Acts 2 and 29. So we know the author of Acts is Luke. 
But what we're about to read right now, the orator or the speaker is the apostle Peter. As Matthew 16 teaches that Jesus Christ gave Peter the keys to the kingdom. And he says that you are going to be the man that's going to open up the door by preaching the kingdom into existence. And in Acts 2, we see his sermon to open up the door and to produce the first fruits of what we now know as Christians. Acts 2, verse 29. You guys there? It says, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently, confidently, that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would take place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Witnesses for the truth. Over here, Peter says that we saw Jesus raised from the dead. And when you think about this claim, there's only a couple options that was made by famous by a man named C.S. Lewis. Well, Jesus claimed to be God. His claims were either false, and he just lied about it, or he did not know they were false, and he was a lunatic about it, or what he's saying is true, and he's Lord. And today, we have to make a decision in your heart, in your conviction. Is he a lunatic, liar, or Lord? And I think one of the greatest pieces of apologetics is the transformation of the apostles. We know that over here, Peter is now preaching the word, and he's preaching boldly to men who just killed Jesus. Think about how radical that is. He's saying, this Jesus who you crucified is both Lord and Messiah. You made a mistake. But he's convinced that he raised from the dead. Now let's fast forward, because we know the Bible is a historical book, and the, the, the dating is hard line. Let's fast forward now from 29 AD to now 64 AD in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter 1 and verse 16. Now we're reading the writings of Peter. 2 Peter 1 verse 16. Where this is what he says about the Bible. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We are ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. So we hear Peter saying that he was an eyewitness to one of the most fantastic scenes of the scriptures where Jesus transfigured into his heavenly body and they heard the voice of God from heaven say what it was written over here. And he's saying that we did not just believe this, we actually saw it. And this is what separates Christianity from any other world religion. Hey, because what happened for this, for this man a couple months later is that he died on a cross upside down next to his wife. For his testimony, living to what Jesus said in Acts 1, you will be my martyr to all nations. I don't know about you. But I ain't dying for no lie. If people say, and not just threaten my life, but my wife's life. And think about this. This man went from a guy who denied Jesus three times to little children to now being, real, being willing to die for him. This separates Christianity from any other world religion. Some have died for what they believed. These men died for what they saw. They were witnesses for the truth. But it just wasn't Peter who died upside down on a cross. He said it wasn't worthy, but it was also Bartholomew. Bartholomew was another apostle. He was skinned alive and then crucified for the truth. John was the only one of the apostles that was not killed by a martyr's death, but they tried to. 
they, they threw him in a hot boiling pot of oil. But then he survived. Then they throw him in the island of Patmos and say, man, you just die by yourself over there. And that's where he writes the book of Revelation. And Jesus encourages him to circulate a letter to call the churches to repentance. But then the apostle that I'm normally born, also Paul, he was also killed. And he was beheaded. Think about this. These men and women were willing to die for what they saw. It must mean they saw the resurrected Jesus. Napoleon Bonaparte once said, I know men, and Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the most famous and successful emperors of France. He said, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ was not a man. Superficial minds see a resemblance between Christ and other founders of empires and the gods of their religions. That resemblance does not exist. There is, between Christianity and other religions, a distance of infinity. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself founded empires. But on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon sheer force. Jesus Christ alone founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men and women will be willing to die for him. Can I get a witness on that? An empire founded by love and truth. Willing to die for him. This man writes about it too. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 12. First Corinthians 15, verse 12. Prior to this, Paul says that Jesus appeared to over 500 people. So when Jesus resurrected, he just didn't like, you know, hide in the, the shadows or anything. Like he was appearing to people. And this is what he says about the resurrection of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. But if it's preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are, not, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him. In fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people must be pitied. Over here, we see Paul saying that if Jesus Christ didn't raise from the dead, Christianity is useless. And what we're doing right now is just, it's a joke, honestly. It's a joke. You come here, you're singing songs, you're clapping, you're getting side hugs and hugs from the brothers and all that awesome things, all that love. But he said, if this is not true, if, if what we're doing right now is just for an earthly life, then we should be pitied because we're fighting for heaven. And he's saying that, no, we were actual true witnesses. And what's amazing about this, when this was written, there were people alive who could have said that this was a lie. They could say, you know what, hey, I was at that, you know, um, when the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, you know, hey, that wasn't, he didn't feed 5,000. It, it was a potluck. I, I brought some fish. They brought some fish. And that's, that wasn't actually true. But no one ever wrote anything like that. You actually look at this right here. There are secular sources like the Jewish Talmud, Josephus, and Tacticus that only verify that what the Bible says is actually true and corroborates it. And these were men who were opponents to what Jesus taught. It has nothing to do with the Bible, but it says that this is actually true. Now, what's amazing about this, that we see the Bible claims to be true, but the issue is people rejected the truth. And maybe here today, you believe that the Bible is true. I mean, you came to church today. Uh, someone invited you out to church, whether it be, I don't know where they met you, on campus or uh, in the gym or at Wingstop. I met my boy Brian at Wingstop last night. Uh, he was my cashier, and you know, I, I needed need my, my wing fix last night. And, and Brian says, oh, yeah, I don't know how, how you guys came here. But I believe maybe you came here and you believe the Bible is the word of God. But now the question is, are you going to put it into practice? And sadly, what we see through centuries of all time, centuries upon centuries, people will hear the word of God but not put it into practice. And it's streamlined throughout the whole Bible. Let's go to Ezekiel 33. 
Ezekiel 33, in verse 30. Ezekiel 33, verse 30, it says, As for you, son of man, your people are talking together about you by the walls and at the doors of the house, and saying to each other, Come and hear the message that has come from the Lord. My people come to you as they usually do and sit before you to hear your words, but they do not put them into practice. Their mouths speak of love, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. Indeed, to them, you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well, for they hear your words, but they do not put them into practice. When all this comes true, and it surely will, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. What this scripture is saying in the Old Testament, that there will be people that will hear the words of God, but not put them into practice. And what they would just see is a man teaching and preaching, but he's nothing but a man who has a good voice and is singing a love song with a guitar. Does that not sound like our modern day Christian society right now? That maybe you are going to church even right now this Sunday. Going to hear a man just sing some love songs with a guitar, but not put the word of God into practice at all. And it says when this come true, they will know that prophets are among them. You know, I saw a meme on uh, Instagram. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Captain Planet. But over here, it talks about the modern day Christian church. People pleasing, weak preaching, sin. Shallow theology, emotionalism equals progressive Christianity. And that is the sad truth of what we're in right now. But then how do we know what the truth is? How can we be true witnesses of the truth? Well, it says in John 8, 31 and 32, it says to the Jews who had believed in Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, then you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You see, the key to understanding the truth is not just coming to service. It's not just knowing the Bible. It's making a decision to put it into practice, to hold on to it and live by it. And then it says, then you will know the truth, and it will set you free. Free from what? John 8, 34 says, free from the slavery of sin and the slave master who is Satan. Do you understand that right now that we're having a great service, but you are in a spiritual world war for your soul? That right now God is fighting so hard, took 99 steps, all you got to do is take one. But Satan is trying to distract you, trying to stop you from the truth, and you got to free yourself this morning and be a witness for the truth. Don't let this be another Sunday where you just come in here, preacher. Let this be a Sunday we make a decision to put the word of God into practice and never turn back again. So that we can be set free. Set free from a life that we're all in before. Where a life that says and distracts us, it says lust imitates love. Pride imitates confidence. Addiction imitates comfort. Sin imitates freedom. Obsession imitates devotion. And Satan imitates God. That's the world we live in, but I believe I'm looking at a group of people who want to make a decision to be set free and be witnesses for the truth. You know, I remember when someone first came to me, invited me out to a Bible study. It changed my life. I was in a position where I was suicidal. I was down. And people looked at my life and said, well, you got all what you wanted. Working as an engineer, making money, prestigious job, and yet... I wasn't fulfilled. And one night I prayed to God, I want to know the truth. I want to do the truth. It just, it's so confusing. 40,000 different denominations. What, should, I, should I be a Catholic? Should I be Anglican? Should I be Baptist? Where is the truth? Then a brother named Christian Enos came to me. <laughs> Leaves our church in Salt Lake City. Yeah. Finding me out to a church. I started studying the Bible. And then July 31st, 2016, I was baptized into Christ. You know, we have a lot of guests here. This is our Bring Your Neighbor Day. Oh, we got it. That's me. I, I was about 160 pounds over there. Skinny guy. And uh, I was very scared. I kind of pixelated. I was, I was standing in line. Would you get baptized? You die. 
And I remember Jason came up to me, and I didn't really know Jason at the time. He wasn't in my studies. He came to me, he was like, look, and Jason's intense, right? He looked me right in the eye, he says, hey, are you, are you ready to die today? I was like, who's this guy telling me I'm ready to die? <laughs> what kind of church is it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, someone made a meme when you just realize that you're a disciple, now you have two birthdays to celebrate. You know, so. But, uh, you know, we have a lot of guests here this morning. And, you know, I want to really encourage you and inspire you. Make a decision to study the Bible. Clear your schedule. Some may say, well, I'm busy. 24 hours in a day, seven days in the week. You make time for what's important to you. Is God important to you? Do you believe this is the truth? Do you want to put it? Some of us have been studying the Bible. Now it's decision time. Decision time. Not just coming to Bible study, but doing the Bible study. Maybe God's calling you to do radical things, like maybe lose a relationship or maybe giving up your job. I don't know what it is, but you got to make a decision. It's going to set you free. Do you believe that? And some of us have been coming, and maybe you've fallen away and you've let go of the truth. I appreciate Diamond who came and got restored today. A teenager. I can't imagine being a teen as a disciple in, in high school. Diamond say an example for many of us here in this pews right now. You've got to get restored in Christ. You let go of the truth. Make a decision to do whatever it takes so that we can be witnesses for the truth. Amen. Point number two. The zeal of the faithful witness. Notice the point. The zeal of the faithful witness. Revelation 1. Verse 5, you can jot that down. It says that Jesus is the faithful witness. As we know, he was a martyr coming down from heaven, died for our sins. And it says you have to be a faithful witness. And we know the goal of God is to win the world for his name. And to achieve this goal, I believe we need to have the zeal of the Lord. As it said in 1 Timothy 2, 3 to 4, that God wants all men to come to knowledge of truth and be saved. Let's talk about the zeal of God. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9 verse 1, verse 2. The Bible says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, the light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation, increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. As warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulder, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. So we hear the Bible is prophesying about Jesus, and it says that he's not going to bring a physical kingdom. He's going to bring a spiritual kingdom that will never end, and that's the kingdom that you and I are a part of. And he says that we need a spiritual solution to spiritual problems. And right now what this world needs is a revolution of love, a spiritual revolution. Because the issues with this world is not the government, it's not what you think. But the issues is, is the heart of men. And they need Jesus Christ to change that heart. And that's the goal of God. But it says the way God's going to do it, the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. What does zeal mean? Well, in the Greek... And Hebrew, zeal could be synonymous with jealousy. And we understand that also means enthusiasm and eagerness, which you understand that zeal, but also means jealousy. Why does this make sense? Because God owns us, so he can be jealous for us. And he says it hurts God's heart when he sees us going after other things other than him and building the kingdom and his family. We serve a jealous God. He wants you to worship him solely. That's a powerful, it's a very powerful emotion, is it not? Jealousy. Some of us maybe felt that unrighteously back in the world, maybe even as a disciple. But 
something you can fight, you know, have that feeling righteously. And, uh, you know, I, I just want to lift up my wife. I love my wife incredibly. Um, I, I, I would say she's the, the, the most well-dressed here today. I just, you know, this week I l- took some time because I, I am a big believer that we have to pray and fast and let God reveal what's in our hearts that what could be holding our relationship with God back and what could be holding back our ministries. So I took three days to pray and fast, and really what was revealed to me is zeal. And as I was doing, we're about to have deed time with the Colomores over there in El Camino, and I literally felt this emotion of zeal. As we sit down, Regine tells me, some, some, some guy, some student, went up to her and hit on her and said inappropriate things. I was ticked off. But she told me, He's right there. So, as as a good husband, with the zeal of the Lord in my heart, I went up to him. I was like, hey, "Hey, bro. But first I invited him to a Bible study. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) And then, obviously, he said no. He's not open to God at all. And I was like, bro, did you hit on that woman over there? And then he started stammering. He's like, oh, I think he knows, what, I think he knows what's happening right now. I was like, bro, that's my wife. Don't ever, ever talk to, like, talk to her like that again. And for that matter, don't talk to anyone like that ever again. And I was like, hey, bro, I, I, I'm, I'm a Christian, but that's my wife right there. You mess with her, you got a problem. But do you know that's how God feels for you? He wants to protect you from sin. He wants to protect you from things in this world. He has a zeal for you. But my question for you, does zeal like God consume you? Because in John 2, 17, the Bible said when Jesus went out to the temple, started flipping tables, Psalm 69, verse 9, was the only thing that came to the disciples' mind. Zeal for his house consumed him. Does that explain you this morning? Zeal for your, for God's house, not your house. Not your life, not what you're trying to build up, but zeal for God's house. That you've got to do whatever it takes to build the kingdom of God. No, I love our leaders, Jason, Sarah. Jason had a great staff lesson. He said something that I think troubled some people. He said, I am unsurrendered to seeing this church not grow. And some people are like, well, what do you mean? Like, we should be surrendered to everything. No, no. Things not growing, a disciple not growing, a Bible talk not growing, and a church not growing is sin. And we're not surrendered to sin. So I take the same stance. I am unsurrendered to seeing this church not grow. I will do whatever it takes, lay down my life for you, and have the zeal for the Lord. But now I'm calling you to that same zeal, because i got to be honest. Some of us have lost some of our zeal. And it concerns me that it does not concern you. Some of our Bible studies have not been fruitful all year. And you talk, it, it concerns me that you're not concerned. And as I prayed and fasted, 2 Corinthians 7 came to my mind. Let's go over there. 2 Corinthians 7. Someone, <laughs> can I get a witness right there? Amen. <laughs> oh, I love this church, man. You know, 2 Corinthians 7. It says in verse 8, even I caused you sorrow by my letter. I don't regret it. Maybe you felt a little hurt by what I just said. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any, by, in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance and leads to salvation, leads to no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. 
what earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourself, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you proved yourself to be innocent in this matter. You know, it's such an amazing passage here. It talks about the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. And it gives you adjectives to know if you are in worldly sorrow or godly sorrow. And I was led to the King James Version of this passage. And I want to read you what the King James says about godly sorrow. It says, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this selfsame thing, that ye sor sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. What does that teach us? It takes zeal to repent. And some of us got to make a decision to be zealous about our repentance. You know, I was so inspired by Jim's contribution and his lesson this past midweek. And I was, I think Jim has one of the greatest, one of the craziest uh, conversion stories. Everybody in the church shared his faith with Jim. From, and, and it really matters with Acts chapter 8 where it says, all except the apostles were scattered, but they preached the word wherever they went. All means all. That means married. That means married with children. That means the elderly. That means the campus, the singles, and the teens. All means all. And they went and preached the word wherever they went. And really, Jim was a benefactor of that. Because the last person I shared with him was a more elderly sister in the church. And that's how he got to church. But what if everyone wasn't sharing their faith? We wouldn't have our brother Jim. Do you understand that God's appointed people for you to meet wherever you're at? That you have a personal, I think some of us think it's up to our Bible talk leaders to share their faith. And you think fruitfulness is for leadership. No, fruitfulness is a disciple thing. And really, if you're a disciple, you're going to prove yourself to be fruitful. And I believe right now what we need is some godly sorrow. But I do want to lift up also our shepherds, often trauma. Yeah. Let me tell you what, you know, I think Regine got first, but I think off is a close second for the, the most well-dressed over here. <laughs> but these are some zealous disciples. And I appreciate them. They've been going after help people get restored. Tromala has been teaming with, teaming with the teen and campus ministry to help baptize Hannah Parker. And then now to help restore Diamond Gilbert, amen. And I love it that people in the Bible talk imitating because, you know, one of our more recent converts, Tina, who just got baptized last December, she had a birthday party for her daughter, and she wanted to make sure that it was evangelistic and make sure she invited her daughters, uh, the, 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 the parents in her school, to make sure that people could hear the word of God. You know, I want to give a, a challenge to all Bible talks to get focused right now, to get focused and zealous. I do think a part of it, too, we can't have zeal without knowledge. I think a lot of us, we're sharpening our swords here and learning how to get to new levels. But I believe that zeal is the way you're going to get there. You can't do it half-heartedly. you got to do it with all of your heart. And I want to challenge all of us to get focused on growth. Focus on your Bible talk being fruitful and focus on your own personal ministry. It should concern you already this year. If you have not been fruitful, that should concern you. And I want you to make a decision to have godly sorrow, not worldly sorrow, so that we can see more souls be saved and we can say we have the zeal of the faithful witness. <laughs> Last point. We're going a little bit over time, but make this point short. Faithful witnesses go to heaven. That's what we're fighting for, you guys. Heaven. It's not about cranking a Bible talk. It's not just about getting married or getting a promotion to your job. It's about heaven. Revelation 11 talks about this. You know, being a Christian, it's not always going to get you good things. After all, we got Jesus the cross. Revelation 11, we're going to go through this passage about the two witnesses. We're going to pick it up in verse 3, where it says, And I'll appoint my two witnesses, and they'll prophesy for 1260, 1260 days. 
clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. They have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. You know, Revelation, there's so many different ideas of what these scriptures mean. But over here, I do believe you see the ebb and flow of what it means to be a disciple. A rise and fall of these two faithful witnesses. Two olive trees, two lampstands. Two witnesses preaching the word of God for 42 months or three and a half years, and that's supposed to represent the time that Egypt was allowed to reign. You can see that in Daniel. They preach in sackcloth, showing the sadness of the dark times and mourning as they preach. But who are these two olive trees, two lampstands, two witnesses? Well, I believe it's, it does say that one had the power to shut up the heavens that it would not rain. And that was Elijah in the Old Testament. And it does say that one had the power to turn the water into blood and start the plagues. That was Moses. And I do believe that's supposed to represent, but it could also represent anyone who wants to be a faithful witness. And that's you and I. God's people, as the lampstands represent the church. And it says these were the two lampstands. But notice, you could jot this down in Revelation 1, 2, and 3. It says that there were seven churches during that time. But now in Revelation 11, there's only two of them. Showing how many have fallen. How many have chosen to stop being a faithful witness and stop preaching the word of God. But what was their reward for preaching the word like this? Well, if you continue reading so we can close out in verse 7 and 10. It says, Now when they had finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them, overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of this great city, which is figuratively called Sodom of Egypt, where also the Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language, and nation, all nations, would gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth would gloat over them, and they'll celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. What was their reward? Being a martyr. And it said the reason why they killed them, because they were tormented by their preaching. We just got to lay it on out. Our message of faith, repentance, and baptism, our message that every single disciple should be sold out and that the church should grow is a tormentation to the dark forces of this world. And they're going to try to stop us by persecuting us. And I believe that in this room, there are people who are going to go out even to other nations. And you may be killed for it. You know, it's been great to be back at USC as a daily ministry. And, uh, you know, being there, it's been awesome as we've seen people come to Christ. It is, it is Caden's first birthday today, which is awesome. Caden yeah. was baptized last year. And, you know, last year we had all of the Operation Jerusalem team come and blitz USC. And we got persecuted for it. Where Regina and I had to go to the deans of religious life. And they investigated our club on campus. And they said, why is it we always have an issue with you guys? And the leader guy told me, told me something very interesting. He said, you know what, there's so many different clubs here on campus. We have no issues with them. But you know what, last year I went to a convention to uh, help more with the Christian clubs in campuses all around the United States. And I realized you guys have different aliases. You guys are called the Harvest here, but I know that your dream over here, you're the Thrive over there, and there's always an issue with that guy Kip's church. And everyone else, we have no problem. And I told him, well, let me, let me tell you this. You know, the Bible does say that when you go before authorities, that God's going to give you the spirit to say what you need to say. I said, let me, let me ask you this, bro. I ain't calling him bro. Sir. Did Jesus, because their issue with us was cold contact sharing. Did Jesus do cold contact sharing? Did the apostles do cold contact sharing? The answer is yes and yes. So your issue is not with us. Your issue is not with Kip's church. Your issue is with the word of God, and you're convicted that you have to do it too. And I believe right now we just got to have a conviction to preach through persecution, preach through setbacks, because through setbacks, God's sending you up for a comeback so you can do even greater things. And really, what happens after they... They preach what we see in verse 11. 
But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. And they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. What ended up happening to the faithful witnesses, they went to heaven. You know, I don't know what's happening right now in your life. But I do know this. Our present suffering is nothing in comparison to the future glory. That whatever it may be, whether it be sickness, death in a family, hardships, financial insecurity, if you stay faithful and be a witness, you're going to go to heaven. And I believe right now what we got to see, as 2 Corinthians 1 says, that we go through trials and tribulations so we can learn how to be comforted by God and comfort others. And Genesis 50 verse 20 says that the dark forces will tend to harm us, but God intended it for good to accomplish something, the saving of many lives. God allows us to go through hard things so we can be comforted by God and then go comfort others. And, you know, I think Satan is trying to go after us to get us to stop preaching. He's got to make a decision that we're saying we're never going to quit. We've all been through things. I've preached from before. The death of my father was a hard thing to go through. Seeing people I love fall away. People that told me, like, they're, I'm like a son in the faith to them, leave and abandon the family. These are hard things. But I understand why I went through those things. To be comforted, to comfort others. And then it was going to produce the saving of many lives. You know, we're going to go to heaven one day if we're a faithful witness. And I don't know how it's going to be, but the Bible says inexpressible things. Maybe we'll have new cuisine there. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we'll, we'll see colors we've never seen before. I don't know. But all I know, it's not going to be easy. And honestly, it looks like many of us said Jesus is Lord before we got baptized. I, you, you didn't know what was going to happen after that. <laughs> and for me, it's been eight years almost, and I'm a rookie in this. <laughs> There's still a lot more to be done. The road is narrow. It might be more narrow than we think. First Peter said that only eight people were saved in a generation of at least 500,000, maybe 5 billion. Eight people were saved. Narrow road. And when God comes back, would you be preaching like those faithful witnesses? Or would you be those enemies looking on in shock? You know, heaven's going to be worth it, though. And I love... The show, The Chosen. <laughs> and if you ever watched it, you know that guy plays Jesus, and that's Judas. I love the calling of Judas in the scene, as we close out here, where Jesus was calling him to become an apostle. And he asked him, are you ready to do hard things? And Judas emphatically says, yes, Lord. I'm ready. And then Jesus just pauses, looks him right in the eye, and says, we'll see. God, the same question for you this morning. Are you ready to do hard things? Are you ready to be a witness to all nations? Are you ready to be a martyr to all nations? Well, in time, we will see. And to God be the glory.